Hello, Salt Strong Nation, Joe Simons, Light Diamonds. We are back. Special episode numero 200. I would say it in Spanish, but I don't know how to speak Spanish very well. Although I'm learning as a homeschool now teacher, Spanish, Chinese, and a few other things. And this is a special episode one because it's 200. Um, that might not sound like a lot, but I mean, that's 200. And usually these things are 30 minutes to an hour and there's hours of prep work and editing behind it. It, is, uh, it has been a lot of work, so much fun, so fulfilling and so rewarding. And I've gotten to meet some great friends. And, um, and, and from the feedback I'm getting from you all, uh, you seem to really like these things. So uh, I'm really, really enjoying them. And Wyatt is one of our newer members, even though he's been around for quite some time. If you're an insider member, you certainly know who Wyatt is. Uh, but Wyatt brought up, he's like, hey, it'd be kind of cool if, if I got to interview. There's some questions that, that I have about you uh, in, in your past and, and Salt Strong and how this whole thing really kind of you know, came about and some of the early struggles and a few times that we were about to give up, et cetera. So I was like, that'd be kind of cool. So uh, this will be a little bit different. I'm going to kind of pass the baton to you, Wyatt, and now you're interviewing me officially. Yeah, no, it's going to be great. I'm really excited to hear some of kind of the Joe Simon story and learn a little bit more about Salt Strong as well. So, I mean, considering the fact that you're a co-founder of probably the biggest online fishing community that the world has ever seen, uh, I want to know my first question, what was the first memorable catch or trip that really got you hooked on fishing? I mean, everybody has one, but that was really where the first inklings of Salt Strong began. So what's that story for you? There's quite a few stories, but um, the, 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 I would say the one thing that, that got me hooked was, was my grandfather. And we were very fortunate, my brother Luke and I, they had to grow up in a family of, of fishermen. My, my grandfather served in the, in the Navy and you know, served in a, in, a, in a war and spent time on battleships and carriers. I mean, he spent a lot of time out in sea. When he came back, I mean, he was, he was a different man and always grew up around the water and, and, and loved boats. But, you know, I think back during those times after World War II, you know, people were trying to get their mind off things. And, and he went like full focus into, into boating. And he was telling us stories, you know, as we grew up with him, he had a condo in Daytona Beach where a lot of our memories were, were really created. Even though we grew up in Winter Haven, Florida, you know, in Central Florida on, on, on a lake bass fishing, uh, we spent every summer at the, at the condo there at the beach house in Daytona beach. And, you know, he told us stories, Wyatt, of this was probably 1950s and he had a, I think it was a 22 or 24 foot boat and they're trying to go offshore. He and a couple of his, uh, his buddies. And back then, you know, now we see these 400, 600, 700 horsepower outboards back then, the biggest one, at least that they could afford and get their hands on was a 25 horsepower. 25 so they had to like jerry rig this boat with two like he he said he was kind of like a pioneer back then 19 i think it's once in 1950 or so they have to put dual 25 horsepower engines on a 20 something foot boat with four guys and he said he would be driving and his three buddies would all be on the very front the very bow of the boat just trying to get enough weight to get it on plane and it would take forever to even get it on plane so we, we grew up a lot of stories like that and he was an old salty dude. I mean, had the old anchor tattoos, the stuff that a lot of men back then did and uh, that, that served in the military. And uh, so we were very, very blessed. And I got a picture here that I, I always keep nearby. And if you're listening to this, you're not going to be able to see it. But that's my grandfather. And that's me with that, that white, like platinum hair. And that's what happens when you live three months a year on the, on the beach every day. And what we did, this is really kind of the first memory, which is why it's a special one to me. And, and we lost him a little while ago at 90, almost 94 years old. And you can see we're at the dock there. And I believe that one's at Ponce Inlet. We would just hit up all these marinas. And he, he would take my, myself and my brother when he got old. I'm only probably three or so right there. It looks like I might even have like some little diapers on or something. Uh, and that's my cousin, Jennifer. And he would take us every day. Like we look forward to, we hit the beach. We get our little ice cream from the ice cream man. And then uh, he would take us to the marinas around that three, four o'clock time to see what all the boats brought in. And back then, you know, the, that was when people were very liberal with how much they kept, meaning they basically, if you caught it, you just kept it. 
Uh, and I'm not saying that's wrong or right, uh, but back then there weren't as many rules. And so like as a kid, I remember just being so fascinated by seeing all the different species. And I was asked questions. You could see here, my grandfather's teaching us about little tuna and stuff and talking about what these fish are and what they were caught on. And so like that was, to me, that was just so fascinating knowing that these boats could go out in the morning and then come back in the afternoon with all these different fish. And as we got older, uh, one of the big things I wanted to do was go with my dad and do something similar. And, you know, we chartered a bunch of boats. My dad had boats his whole life. And uh, I remember one, we, we caught three, three, no, two blue marlin and a white marlin, a striped marlin. And uh, that was, I was probably nine. I mean, what an experience in the Bahamas. And I still have that picture up as, uh, as well. And just really, really cool. And another kind of just funny story uh, about my, my dad who, who also followed, followed suit with, uh, uh, with my grandfather. I used to tell the story as a kid. I thought it was so cool that my dad won this boat and it was a bass boat and we lived, you know, lived on the, on the water there in, uh, in Winter Haven, Florida. And, uh, and it turns out he didn't win it. He, he got it at auction for like $11,000, but he told my mom and everyone that he won. It. <laughs> Obviously everyone found out the truth pretty quickly. We thought, Oh my gosh, my dad won a free boat. And, you know, I turned out later after telling all my friends that, that he actually, you know, spent 11,000 to probably get an $18,000 boat, uh, which was, uh, which was pretty funny, but yeah, we, we've just grown around our whole lives. And, um, I, I would, I would say there's not one like, catch that that did it but it was just all of those memories and then this stuff in particular on the saltwater side of, of just going to those marinas and ironically not even catching fish just being fascinated by everything that was uh, that was being caught yeah and i mean that's that's really those early times where you're going out you're experiencing the water as a kid and seeing all the different fish and everything like that it's memories like that that you just kind of tie into the happy times of fishing so i mean what really do you love the most is it that that time with family that you spent that those memories get brought up every time you kind of get to the water you've got those smells of the salt in the ocean or is it is it the challenge of chasing those fish is it is it does it help you feel closer to god when you're out there i mean what is it that you love the most uh, when you're out there fishing well that's a that's a loaded question and i mean the truth is it, it changes over time right just like your goals in life and, and your purpose in life and, and probably even your relationship with, with God and with Jesus. And I would say growing up, it was more the fascination and it was the thrill. And then in high school and college, my brother was a really good fisherman. Like you know, he would win tournaments. Like he was just, he had a gift and I was always stronger and faster. And he will admit that. I mean, I, I could lift more weights. I could hit a home run farther. I could throw a football farther. I could run. I mean, everything on the muscular side, I was a little bit better and stronger. And I was a little bit older. Uh, but, and he was always a little bit kind of scrawnier. But when it came to fishing and like finesse and, and patience, he could kill me. Like it wasn't even close. So that was one thing I was kind of always driving. At. We're, you know, obviously competitive. We like to win. And so during those high school and college years, it was more about winning. And, and like against friends and other people. And then it kind of shifted into like winning against the fish, right? You know, I, I, I obviously, I, you know, all of a sudden I got a job and I had a little bit more money and I started traveling a lot, like, you know, caught, caught my first marlin, wanted to go catch big yellowfin tuna. It was more about that, that, oh my gosh, I want to catch fish. And then all of a sudden family, you know, came into my life, which I mean, completely changed everything. When all of a sudden you have a wife and, and kids, not just to support, but, but to encourage to get outside and, and, and to share the same kind of things that my dad and my grandfather shared, it, it, it shifted big time. And now, I mean, behind me, you probably can't see them because they're so low, but I mean, half those rods are kid rods, right? I mean, who would have, no, no one in their 20s does that. And or very few people do at least. And, and now that I have kids, a lot of it is trying to recreate some of those memories, taking them, you know, to marinas, uh, taking them out on the boat and showing them a lot of the same things that, that, you know, my parents and, and, and grandparents showed me. Um, and, and the last thing you said, I believe, was about God. Yeah, I mean, that, that has certainly changed. Once again, high school, absolutely no. Uh, it was more about just running the gun and catching as many fish as we can and out fishing our buddies and, and getting as, uh, as many cool stories as we could. And, and now it, it's less about the fish and, and more about those memories and about the, the peacefulness of it. And some of my best trips, whether they're out, you know, now, ironically, I live on a lake, not saltwater. And uh, whether it's on the lake or it's out there in the, on the ocean, 
uh, usually those first few minutes in the first last, regardless of what happens in the middle, that's where I'm doing like a lot of just deep breathing and being thankful and just taking in the smells and the sights. And I used to not do that. I used to, like I said, I was just ready to catch fish. And it, it's interesting how it's changed. And, and I've seen that in my, in my dad. I mean, he's got, you know, still a, a, a nice boat and a couple kayaks and he'll take them out usually once a week. Uh, he's doing something. And so many times he's just like, man, what an amazing trip. I was like, well, how many fish you catch? He's like, I didn't really catch anything. I got a couple of strikes. He was like, it was just so neat being out there in the mangroves and, you know, and, and just relaxing and getting away from all the chaos uh, that we're living in right now. And so it's, uh, it, it is neat to, to see what fishing can do to people. And we've had multiple episodes with some past, you know, veterans and, and people who have like seen legitimate healing from fishing and being on the water. And I, I think that's just so fascinating. Uh, what not just saltwater, but just being out in the water, being outside what God and nature can do for you. Absolutely. And I think there's a really interesting journey that almost every angler takes and, and yours is no exception. It's this process where you start learning very early on in your life. You're usually taught by somebody, uh, in this instance, your grandfather and your father, and then you kind of grow a little bit older and you take those practices and you start kind of chasing that big game. You start going after that challenge of the fish. And then it turns into later on in life, it's, and once you've kind of mastered that, that art of the big game hunt, you start teaching the little ones again. It comes full circle. And there's that really interesting journey uh, of teaching somebody else the sport. And I think that's where it gets really gratifying. But one thing that you touched on was that you started getting a little bit more money, you're able to pursue uh, some larger fish and things like that. And that's around the time that I'm sure that you started having some inklings uh, of salt strong started thinking, hey, this is something that I really love to do. This is something I'd like to kind of bring more people in. And again, that journey of being able to teach more people as well. So what made you give up that six figure salary and risk everything on salt strong? Yeah, Luke and I had just because we grew up fishing, it meant so much to us and our family. We saw how it how it united our family and all of our, our vacations around fishing, our best memories. And we lost our grandfather. I, I've shared the story before, but every memory we got twelve grandkids, including myself and, and Luke and our other brother Daniel, and we're all going around the table, you know, having a beer it, right after his funeral. And um, and and every memory was around that beach house and around boating and you know him out there, you know creating these crazy rigs for us to go catch, you know, whiting and pompano and stuff off the beach. And it, it was interesting. No one brought up what, what he gave us for Christmas. You know, no one brought up any of the, the frivolous stuff that, that many of us might get excited about on a day-to-day -day basis, but all those, those deep ingrained memories were, were from the experiences that he created out there. And, and I share that with you to, to let you know, I mean, that, that was just something we always talked about is like, man, how cool would it be to have some kind of fishing company? And we didn't know what that meant, but it was always something we talked about. And we spent a lot of time on little Gasparilla Island. We were very fortunate. Uh, a guy that worked for my dad had built a house by hand on little Gasparilla and he ended up getting a little too old to go use it a lot. And it was back then, like no one locked their doors, just a little hide a key. And he's like, yeah, go use it anytime you want, just clean it up. And so we were there all the time. And I remember just dreaming about, hey, man, it'd be so cool to, to, ha to have a fishing company. And then the real world happened. You know, we, we got jobs and, and all of a sudden, like the dream kind of died, which is it's sad. And I think that happens to, I would say, probably the majority of Americans. You have some, you know, dream growing up, whether it is to be an artist or a firefighter or whatever it is. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, real world happens, and then you make excuses. And, and I know because we, I did for many, many years, and just kind of like, oh, man, it would have been cool. But, you know, I've got this going for me, and I got health insurance and all this stuff. And, um, I mean, the cancer was, was kind of a big thing for me. That was 2008. Um, obviously, crazy times you know, in the financial world. I mean, lost a lot of money. Um, just it was, it was, it was, I mean, it, was, it seems very similar to today. We're just like a lot of fear and, and, and anxiety, and, and no one really knew what was going on. Then I found out I had cancer. And so I was just like, man, like, can life get any worse? And uh, that was an eye opening moment for me. Obviously, I survived. And, and it was just like, you know what, like, life's too short. And it's sad that it takes uh, an almost dying experience for, for someone to realize that. But that was a big moment where, where Luke and I both just kind of said, man, life's too short, because he saw me struggling with it. I mean, no one, you know, likes to see a brother or a loved one go through that. And so it was, it was just kind of a traumatic time. We're like, well, man, you know, people are losing their, their wealth. I'm almost losing my health. Uh, let's just pursue what we love. And so we talked about it. 
We prayed on it. Nothing happened. And, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, our friend Amy, who interest, introduces these two random guys, I never even met them before, and, uh, and they put an offer to buy our, our little company, the financial services industry. And uh, we're like, all right, this is it. No turning back. And so we signed a, a two-year non-compete, uh, sold our company, not necessarily because we hated it, but it wasn't our passion. You know, it wasn't our purpose. And, and we knew we were being called to do something in the fishing world. The bad news is after we sold it, we woke up and we had, we had some money, but it wasn't like the, you know, what the New Yorkers called the screw you money where you could, you know, go buy planes and that kind of stuff. But it was enough to get us by for about a year without having to really worry about too much and still be able to invest a little bit in the salt strong. And, and all of a sudden a year goes by and we still don't really have a good business plan. We were just teaching. We knew we wanted to teach. We, we knew we wanted to, to, to recreate some of those same experiences that our grandfather taught us and our dad taught us with knots and, and, and how to catch fish uh, using the internet. Uh, but we didn't have a business plan, which is really stupid looking back. And, and all of a sudden now 12 months, 13 months, 14 months, and we kept saying next month, it's going to be it. And we got away to 18 months and we still hadn't paid ourselves a penny. I mean, nothing. And it, it's one thing to say you're going to do that. It's another one to do it and live it and have a spouse and kids. And I mean, it just seemed like every problem possible happened. Uh, like one of my children in an emergency room for a, for a while, uh, and one was, you know, $114,000 bill. Thank goodness we had private insurance, but still our deductible was like 14 K and it's just like, all right, there's 14,000 out the door. And it's just like, this money was disappearing so fast. And, and there was a point we, we definitely were, were scared. Like, it, you know, did we make a bad decision? Uh, is, is this going to work? Like, do we have a business plan? And fortunately now we are, uh, here we are over five years later and it's now profitable and we have, you know, great employees like you and, uh, and just a really phenomenal team. But yeah, it was, it, it was, it was really, really wild. And I think most people will tell you that when they, they pursue their purpose. And that doesn't mean you got to start your own company. I mean, the American, the whole world was not made for that to happen. That's, that would be a horrible decision for the majority of people, but it also means even like you did, Hey, follow your passion and, 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 and be an entrepreneur, like create your own, basically create your own future and your own purpose doing something that, that someone else has kind of built and you build your own little wing off of it. Um, but doggone, man, it was, it, it was super, super scary uh, looking back. Uh, but I'm so grateful we did it. And, and now who, who would have ever thought I could say, I'm so grateful I had cancer because I had that, all that happened during that right time. I probably never would have, would have taken the leap. Yeah. And I mean, that's, I mean, that's a lot to face. And I, I do want to know a little bit. I know you said it was really scary. It was really tough. What would you say yourself was the biggest challenge during that time? And I don't mean growing from a business perspective. I mean, for you adjusting and growing to who you are today. Now, um, the successful co-founder of Salt Strong, what in your personal drive or mantras that you adopted, what things did you do to get you through those tough times? Did you ever feel like you were going to have to give up and what kept you going? In that time frame. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, we signed a two year non compete. And there was a day that Luke and I had to go back to the contract, just to see if there's any loopholes, see if we can get back in the old business. Uh, and a lot of people don't know that. But I'll just kind of tell you the the whole business model that that we thought was going to work was we knew how to drive traffic online, like we realized that uh, no one was really doing a great job at it in terms of teaching. You know, you had fishing shows and this, this is in terms of education. Most fishing shows are entertainment, but there's some like our friend CA that, you know, they, they, they do some great education, but that's, you know, on TV, right? Um, it, it's not online. It's not like a blog post. It's not really like how to, it's, it's kind of a mix between entertainment and education. Then you had fishing magazines and they, they were trying their best not to go online because they wanted to have the physical you know product in someone's house. And I get that. And so we started doing all this online how-to and information and it started growing like crazy. And so we're like, all right, we got all these eyeballs. We'll just sell ads to other companies that want to get in front of them. And I remember we, we got to a, a number, I believe it was like 500,000 people a month on our site, which is a lot for a, for a niche, like inshore saltwater fishing space. And uh, I reached out to a handful of people, including Under Armour. And I got connected, Tom Rowland connected me with one of the I think he's like number two or three guy in all of Under Armour and I got 30 minutes with him. And it's like, we had prayed on it. Like, we're like, this is it. He's going to give us this massive check. 
And he, he loved what we were doing. He was a super nice guy. And at the end, he's like, man, I'll be honest with you. He's like, um, I'd probably pay you 500 bucks a month, maybe a thousand, uh, you know, to kind of sponsor. And like my heart sank, like I little, I cried and I felt like I'd let, you know, myself down, my brother down, my wife down me, all these dreams. Like it literally just was crumbling in front of me. And Luke was waiting on my call and I, I couldn't even call him. I was just like, man, uh, I felt, I felt like a failure. And, and I remember when I called him and he's like, well, like, what's, what, what did he say? What's the news? And I was like, I was like, we're screwed. <laughs> I was like, we're, we're screwed. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, uh, he's like, he might give us 500 bucks a month. And, and, and to give you an idea at the time, we were just to keep a website up with that much traffic. I mean, you might be spending a thousand dollars a month just for the hosting, like just to have all that up. Websites aren't free. And with email, we're another thousand. Like we were spending thousands of dollars a month, maybe even as high as six or seven thousand, just keeping the lights on, even though we were working from home at the time. And so like we were so negative and that's without we haven't paid ourselves because it's just you keep we keep losing money every month. And so that was dude, that was a tough time. And a lot of it came down to faith. Uh, you know, we realized we couldn't go back. Thank goodness. Another, another one of those, you know, kind of prayers that we didn't see it at the time, but it definitely got answered. Cause had we been able to go back, I, I could have made a call and, and started another business like overnight because I had all the resources. I still had a great name in the industry. I had all the contacts. I, I could have just written off salt strong and gone right back to where I was and probably make a hundred thousand bucks a year really, really quickly, if not overnight. So thank goodness I couldn't legally, uh, we couldn't break that contract. So we're like, we got to do it. We got to have faith. We're going to just start listening to our audience. So that was a really, really big thing that so many business owners and entrepreneurs don't do, including me. You know, we kept thinking, oh, it's, we're just going to sell ads. It was more about us, us, us. And the second we just said, guys, like, what do you want? And, and we listened and people said, hey, like, I'm struggling over here. I would love to see where you guys go fish. I, I would, someone actually said, I would pay money if you guys would film, because we were fishing every week, like film your spots, like not necessarily the spots, but more the, the why, like why were you fishing that spot? Why were the redfish there during that week? And, and we started doing it and we started charging money for it. And, and that became the Insider Club. And for about a year, uh, you, you couldn't even find it. It wasn't even on our website. It was imitation only. We would basically invite people who were super engaged in our community and on our blog page and say, Hey, you might want to come join us here. And all of a sudden we had a hundred people and then a couple hundred and you know, now we're 13,000 people are, are paying for this. Now, of course it's expanded, uh, all over the place and we have discounts on every rod, reel and line and lure and sunglasses. I mean, now, now it's, it's got a life of its own and its own private community, but um, to answer your, your question in terms of, of kind of the learning lessons, it was one, listen, listen to your audience. I mean, just listen, to, if you listen close enough, people will tell you what they want and, and have faith. Uh, if, if you believe that you were called to do it, you have to have faith. Now, I think there are some times where there's signs that, Hey, this was just, this was not meant to be. And you also need to know when to, to walk away and say no. But I knew deep in my heart. I, and I, and I knew because of the feedback we were getting in that we were growing the audience. I knew we were onto something. Uh, now had it been shrinking, I would have been really scared, but, but I, I just, we knew that this is what we were called to do and we stuck with it and, uh, and listened and just persevered and, and had to work our butts off. I mean, it, it was every single day, as my wife will tell you, it was, I mean, Saturday, Sunday, Sunday nights, it was, it was nonstop just putting out content and listening, putting out content and listening and refining and uh, listening to what people want. Yeah. And I mean, you and Luke grinding for so many, so many months and years and, and now fast forward, here we are, we've got this amazing community and you're not, I mean, you're still working really hard, but you're definitely not having to break your back uh, like you were in the past. And I just want to know now that you've got this awesome community um, of all these anglers. What is the most satisfying thing through all this work that every day you wake up and man, this is, this is, this is why I love this so much. Where does that come from? Oh, that's a, there's a couple. I mean, one, I, I'd say the friendships, even friendships of, of people like you that have joined the team all, all because of this, you know, really kind of a movement in this community that we've, we've created. And, and then number two is, is that, is that community? Uh, I, I, I use the word friendship very loosely because I feel like I know a lot of these people, even though I haven't met half of them. 
Um, but I, I love that part of it. I, I love the connections, right? Because it's one thing to sell a product or a service. I mean, that, that's great. That's revenue. But, but you can't replace that community. And, and especially right now, you know, why it, it, with this whole coronavirus thing, we've realized that we can't go enjoy the normal things that we would call community, whether it be going downtown in the, the market area or hanging out with your friends and going to a movie or church all of these communities have kind of been taken from us. But the one thing that hasn't been taken and really now has a massive light shined on it are these online communities. I'm not saying it should replace a hand to hand, a hand, -to -hand handshake or a eye contact, but it, man, it's been really, really special to know that we have a community of people that, that, that you can ask a question to and ask a prayer of you. And I, I think that part is, has been really, really cool um, and, 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 and just really, really special. And I, knowing what I know now too, about our old company, because this is not my first gig out of, out of school. I know that I would, I would, I don't want to say I didn't like them because that's not the right word, but I would kind of dread getting phone calls and messages from like the majority of my customers. They were just needy people. They, some of them were just super mean and, and probably didn't have the best morals, and they, they, they were just people I wouldn't want to hang around outside of business. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah. if I wasn't, if I wasn't making money off of them, I probably never would have hung around them. And, and that kind of happened. I mean, there's still some of my really close friends from that old business that I still hang out with. And ironically, most of us had fishing in common. Uh, but that's, that's what I see now is I love hearing from people. I like, I get a kick out of every morning and every, every evening logging in the community and seeing what all of our customers are doing. I love hearing from them. It is just night and day how much more we love our customers. Um, it, it, that part has been really, really cool. And then the final piece, the part that, that really keeps us moving, and you'll, you'll see it in some of my comments in the community when I see a mom or a dad or a grandparent post a picture of, of them with, with their kids or, or sometimes they're grown kids for the first time, they've now put them on a fish. And, and I always write creating memories that matter. And, and that, that, cause that's really what we're doing. And even like a Disney world, you could say they do all this stuff at the end of the day. I mean, they're creating memories. And, and that's a big takeaway is growing up in central Florida and spent a lot of time at Disney. I was like, man, like it would be cool if, if we could create memories like this for people, right? I mean, people taking their, their picture in front of Cinderella's castle, cheesy as that might be, that's a memory they're not going to forget. And it's why people will go spend 10 times more than they ever budgeted at Disneyland and they go tell all their friends how amazing it was. And they have all these pictures and, and the family wants to go back again. And, and we're, we're trying to do the same thing with fishing to really make it fun. And when I get a message from, from a mom or dad, either privately or in the community saying like, thank you guys, you, because of something I learned here, you helped me go create this memory. Boom. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. Uh, you can't put a price tag on that. And, and the more of those we get, the more it fuels the fire. I mean, you, you see occasionally I'll send an email out to the whole team saying like, guys, you got to read this. And it, it's a whole lot more than just fishing, right? It, it's a whole lot more than, oh, I caught my personal best trout or redfish or snook or flounder or tarp or whatever it is. It's like, you guys help me and my family do something I've been trying to do for years. And man, that, that, that's really, really special. Yeah. And I mean, going to the last meetup that we had, the Christmas party, it was, it was overwhelming because there were so many people there and I was seeing them come up and hug you and shake your hand. And, and same thing with Luke too. They were so ecstatic to see you guys. And it seemed like every single one of them had an interesting story to tell you about how the insider club, what you had created had helped better their lives. I mean, they had gone out with friends, family, so many people showed up uh, with their husbands and wives. And it was like, we're now fishing together. We've been able to teach each other um, through Salt Strong and teach our kids as well. And it was, it was so crazy seeing how many people's lives had been changed by this. So I, I just, I cannot imagine what it's like for you to think, oh man, I've created this. I've, I've brought all these people together. I've been able to teach all these people. And I think, uh, I think that is what is the most amazing thing about the Insider Club is this giant platform where everyone can come together and learn. And again, even with all the craziness going right now with the virus, we've still got people in the community that are still sharing that information with each other, helping each other out. Almost, I mean, whether it's in person or online, we have given a platform for 
all these people to uh, just connect. And it's been absolutely amazing. But now that we've got this, and again, it's an amazing community, what are the plans for the future? Not just for Salt Strong, but for you as well. What are any personal goals uh, that you still have yet to achieve? Yeah, I mean, the, the great news about this whole learning process is, is we, um, we realized how important it is you know, to, to have a vision. Uh, a lot of companies have a mission, right? Like, you know, ours has, has been to unite families was, was really the, the main bullet point that was always at the top. It wasn't to help someone, you know, catch a personal best Marlin or something. It was really just to unite families through, through fishing. Like that's the, the number one bullet that continues to drive us. But what most people don't get right is, is the vision. And the vision is where you're going. Um, and, and, and it needs to be written down. It, it really needs to have a specific date when done right. And we didn't do this for, gosh, the first three and a half, might have been four years. So, yeah, we're, we're now, what, five years and a few months in. And we've only had that written out vision statement um, for probably about a year now. And I think when we got that, a lot changed. Like it, it, there was, the, it wasn't one of those things where you could say, oh, it changed like revenue wise. Cause it really, it didn't change there as much overnight, but there was something that shifted. There was like a click and all of a sudden the team members got it. The, the outside got it. Our insiders got it. Our audience got it. People like you got it. People started becoming attracted to us. Like, oh, okay. I know where they're going now. And one of the main things that seems to get a lot of attention, it's the very bottom bullet point on that vision statement, you guys, if you're listening or watching, you can go to saltstrong.com and, and look at the about page. You don't see it right there is this theme park. And I have had that in my head. I think a little bit because of the Walt Disney, uh, uh you know, deal of, of having some kind of park. And I don't, I'm not talking roller coasters. I, I'm talking about, uh, think of like Disney meets the, the masters. So you got a beautiful, just a beautiful, well manicured place with no cell phones. Uh, meets like the, um, the the Bass Pro, the Worldwide Sportsman in Isla Mirada, where you actually have marina and, and restaurants and, and, a, and a big tank full of fish, uh, in both outdoor and indoor. And you have boats that you can go charter. You got fishing guides and, and fishing coaches and, uh, and a little hotel. And so that's kind of the big vision. I, uh, over here to the side I, uh, of me, I'm not going to show it to you because uh, this is a uh, super, super confidential. But uh, I mean, even have, you know, a couple properties uh, that, that we have picked out and kind of have it all, all mapped out and even, even a church on the, on the property, uh, you know, non-denominational for people that, that are staying the weekend and, and want to have that aspect, aspect of it as, uh, as, as well. And so it'll be very unique and very different than anything out there. And that's just a big driving force. I, I don't know that we'll be able to do it ourselves. I think that's another thing that I'm learning about myself. I've always been that guy that just kind of wants to do it and not necessarily in the, in the control aspect of things. It's more of just like, I, I think it is some pride and ego of just like wanting to say I did it myself. And I'm, I'm realizing that we're probably going to have to ask for some help from, you know, some bigger names or, and or companies to, to make that happen. Uh, so that's been another thing that, that I've been, you know, personally learning that it, it's good to ask for help. Uh, it, it's, it, it sometimes it's essential and, and needed to collaborate and ask for help. So that's, that's something that I think about every single day is, is that theme park. And it, once again, it, it ties into our, our main mission to unite families, to bring people together. And it's really the next level too. I mean, as you know, pretty much everything we do is online with the exception of some of our meetups and our, you know, annual party we do with our insiders. I, I know there was like, we had this like surge of meetups that were happening and all of a sudden this virus thing hit. And, and now, you know, once again, shows the importance of having an online community and an online network, but really that next, next level is, is building a whole place, you know, like, you know, on a thousand acres, this is not going to be a, like, I want something that's going to be big. I, I wrote down 50 acres. Uh, I think, um, I don't know. I think I was a little bit shy of like, Oh my gosh, what are people going to think of me when I, when I say these crazy, cause it's still crazy today. It was even crazier a year and a half ago when we wrote it. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I want a massive park where tons of people can come together and, uh, and unite through fishing and, 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 and learn and experience and once again, create those memories uh, that matter. So that's, that's a really big driver for, uh, for me personally. And in terms of other personal goals, I mean, it, it kind of just ties in with all that is, is how many people can we impact? You know, we, we judge the company of both, you know, revenue, because obviously it, it, we employ people like yourself and eight others now and, and their families. So this is supporting families as, uh, as well. 
uh, that part keeps me up. I want to make sure that continues to, to happen and everyone is flourishing and, and growing and feels very abundant. Uh, but two, the other thing that we, we measure is, you know, how many people are impacting, how many of these insiders are, are, are engaged, how many of them are sending us messages uh, that, that say, hey, I, I just had the most amazing time. I cannot thank you guys enough. And then we have this whole unchurch thing, which is a little bit more recent. Uh, but that was something we felt God was calling us to do is to, to actually use our business for the, for the greater good. And even though some people would say that's absolutely crazy, it's been purely magical to see what has happened within our company and, and within our, our employees and, and within our, our really our whole community once we launched uh, the Unchurch. And, and I'm really excited to see where that goes. I have no, no idea, but I, I'm learning a lot about myself through those and, and asking some really just kind of tough questions that I think a lot of us struggle with, with, with God and, and with, uh, with, with faith and, uh, and, and, and just this, the big question of why. You know, why were we put here? What's, what's your purpose? What's your mission? Uh, you know, why, why do bad things happen to good people? We're answering a lot of those really tough questions. So that's, uh, that's, that's been cool for me personally. And I love the fact that these are questions I'm struggling with and I get to share, you know, kind of the experience and, and some of the answers I'm discovering along the way with, uh, with thousands of people. So that's been really cool. Yeah. And I mean, and it touch back on the theme park again, I, I, I know a lot of people will always try to say, oh, this is too crazy. This is something that might not be able to happen. And time and time again, we have proved that, that with not only God on our side, but this amazing community, really anything is possible. And uh, I think that the goal that you have wanting to impact as many people as you can uh, is something that is a good thing. And I think uh, all that goodwill is always going to be successful for you and put you in a position uh, to just achieve, uh, again, these amazing uh, community goals um, and, and growing this park uh, to, to something that is uh, real. So I do want to ask really quickly, we've got a couple questions from insiders, rapid fire. Um, I'm going to ask you four ones real quick if you want to answer those for me. So the first one, obviously, I think I know the answer. What is your favorite fishing lure? Fishing lure? Slam shady, baby. Come on. Easy. Easy. So <laughs> What next one? If you could fish one place in the world, and this is outside of the United States, where would it be? Uh, Panama. I've traveled all over the world, Australia, New Zealand, Costa Rica. I've never fished Panama, and it seems like you can catch so many different amazing species in Panama. Mm -hmm. So what is your favorite fish to target and why? I would say snook, just snook. because we grew up bass fishing. And that was the first saltwater fish that I remember, probably at 11 or 12. And, and I caught a legit, almost like 20 pounder uh, in Marco Island. It was just like, I can't believe these things exist. And they're kind of like bass on steroids. Uh, they behave similar, they explode, uh, they fight like crazy. So I, I would say a snook if, if, you know, if that's all I could target for the rest of my life kind of a fish. It's funny, Luke said the same thing when I first asked him that question. And he said, if you want to get someone hooked on saltwater fish, and that's the that's the fish to do it with. So oh, that's yeah. awesome. And now I guess I would say, what is your number one bucket list fish that you have not caught yet? Oh, easy. Black Marlin. I, I have, you know, always had a fascination with, you know, Hemingway and and, and reading old stories uh, about the offshore fishing and the black marlin is, you know, the ba basically the biggest, grandest marlin uh, out there and get over a thousand pounds, usually caught off of Australia. And I went to Australia, I spent a couple months there and did not get to go, actually went offshore fishing, but did not get a chance to actually target black marlin just wrong, wrong time of the year. And I've always just had that, that goal in the back of my head to be able to catch uh, a black marlin. Uh, I mean, just what a challenge to get like an 800, a thousand pound fish. And I obviously I want to catch a big black marlin, not a, not a juvenile, oh, uh, yeah. but yeah, that would be, that would be sick. Yeah. And I mean, obviously I think everyone will be excited for that insider report. So we'll keep an eye out for that one. But I think that wraps up all those insider questions, Joe, man, it has been pretty awesome talking to you about all this stuff. I think we went over some really interesting topics today. I got to learn a little bit more about you, even though I've known you for, what is it, almost a year and a half now? I mean, I thought I knew all this stuff, but gosh, it was uh, it was really cool to hear all this from you. We did a, a great job, man. Uh, thank you for, for having, this was your idea. So thank you for creating the idea for episode 200. This has been fun. Absolutely. And I guess I'm taking over now, the the exit. Is that what, what's happening? I think so. I think... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's like, come on, help me out here. So 
got yeah so why first and foremost thank you and um if you made it this far thank thank you so much for all the support this is uh this has been fun and, and even just some of these questions are taking my mind back down memory lane these these last five years and then prior to that with you know just some of the family life and kind of how all this thing happened and uh so if you have any other questions on it let us know we'll put a whole you know blog post on saltstrom.com forward slash podcast so saltstrom.com forward slash podcast we'll have some uh pictures i'll make sure to get this picture of my uh my my grandfather there and uh and along with some other things that we uh we discussed and uh finally just join us in the insider club i i really do believe what i said in, in terms of I, I don't believe there's been a more important time to to have a community uh online that you can access 24 7 and uh we're seeing it right now I mean, we're seeing how fast this thing is, uh, is is growing. We've been very, very blessed that we keep getting more insiders joining every single day. And, uh, and I know you'll be blown away when you get it. My buddy, Chris, who's been a good friend of mine, good fisherman, owns a boat, has who knows how many thousands of dollars of rods and reels. And he always kind of struggled. And he, yet he knew we had it. And he's just like, oh, man, like, I don't understand how an online community is going to help me. And he finally joined after like a year. And he's, he calls me up. He's like, Joe, he's like, I spent the last couple hours in here. He's like, why didn't you tell me you had this? I was like, Chris, I've been telling you this entire time. He's like, no, no, you didn't tell me about like all this stuff. He's like, this is crazy. And so that's, that's usually the impression that people get when they finally get into like, oh my gosh, I, I get it now. I get why you guys are constantly talking about it because it, it works and it truly is a family. There are amazing friendships being, being made. And as I said, the ultimate goal is just creating more memories, more memories that matter. And uh, that's what excites us. So hope you join us there. You can find out more at saltstrong.com. Otherwise, we'll uh, talk to you on episode 201. It's crazy. 201. Big 201. 201. Woo! Thanks, guys. Thanks, Wyatt. Peace. <laughs>